All right, welcome, both of you, um, to this fourth lecture in the series on the future of the common European science. This time we have Tiziana Caponio from the University of Turin and also from the college. Collegio Carlotta. Which I don't know what that is. Ah, uh, it is a kind of high uh, education institution in Italy, supporting especially research more than teaching. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, we're very happy that she's here because she has a very long experience in research and teaching as well, by the way, on 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 issues like the multi-level governance of migration, which of course is the core issue. If you want to talk about the future of the common European asylum system. Yeah. Um, what else should I say? Um, I, th I don't think I should say anything <laughs> else. <laughs> Just give the floor to you. And well, thank you very much. Thank you. So, thank you very much for inviting me today uh, and for your kind presentation. Yes, Colleague Carlo Alberto is. Uh, sort of uh, high-level research institution, Italian, but actually based in, in Turin, which is my city, and uh, founded by um, the company at San Paolo, which is a banking foundation. So, you know, it's a kind of partnership with universities to support uh, research, and part of this research that I will be presenting today has been carried out in partnership between the University of Turin and College of Carlo Alberto. So just to give you a bit of a background. So yeah, as uh, was as Heron was saying, I've been working quite extensively on the multi-level governance of migration. And in particular, what I'm going to present today is um, part of a book that is just out of the book ledge. And you can see here the, uh, the front of, of the book, Coping with Migrants and Refugees, uh, Multilateral Governance Across the EU. Um, and in this, this, in this book, we, uh, together with the Council, with a colleague at Thierry, Research Institute of Migration in Turin, we try to address this puzzle of uh, the link between uh, asylum seekers' conception and the multi level governance, especially in the aftermath of the 2015 refugee crisis. We have been looking at what happened uh, during the crisis and how the arrival of asylum seekers was uh, actually. Uh, addressed by different actors, uh, how they uh, reacted, but try also, try also engage in implementing the principle, very big principles that have been, uh, that have been um, at, at the center of the uh, European EU uh, legislation, in particular the reception directive of 2003, that established the necessity to provide some base, baseline services to uh, the uh, seekers and refugees in terms of education for minor children, also access to the labor market, basic services, assistance. So, you know, this directive provided a kind of uh, general framework of some minimum standards that had to be ensured to every seeker in the EU, but then left quite a lot of, uh, of margin uh, to, uh, to national uh, governments, to the member states to implement the directive, and uh, also um, provided quite a lot of. Uh, of freedom to uh, lo the local level authorities to step in and to elaborate more on the kind of services to be provided. Because, of course, the issue of asylum seeker receptions is very much um, overlapping and interconnected with social assistance more generally, where local level authorities in many member states uh, are, are quite uh, central uh, key actors. So we explored this puzzle in the um, you know, classical terms of multi-level governance challenge, 
So, um, as the university cares section is somehow bringing together multiple actors, uh, um, specific actors that deal with refugees, but also more generally uh, all those uh, actors, organizations that are engaged in social assistance. And so this raises a lot of coordination issues, uh, risks of overlaps, but also of uh, uh, possible, um, you know, uh, methods to improve coordination in order to avoid these overlaps or possible conflicts. So multi-level governance is actually uh, trying to address this issue of coordination as um, from, from a different perspective than the traditional state-based top-down kinds of intervention and uh, try to uh, and so, yeah, in the multi-level governance perspective, is actually trying to uh, understand how actors coordinate beyond what is the hierarchical uh, traditional state uh, implementation, state level implementation. So, uh, Uh, you can have a look here. There is something that doesn't have you to. Oh, okay. This one? Yeah, I Okay, so yeah, to uh, give you a bit of, of an idea of the approach multi level governance, what does it mean uh, for political scientists and policy scholars in particular? Usually, with this term uh, in the literature, to me, two understandings are uh, very uh, common. In particular, many scholars use the notion of multi level governance to somehow describe the kind of state of, uh, of the situation, you know, there's a descriptive no notion and um, to indicate the fact that state authority is dispersed across multiple uh, actors, uh, levels of government and, and so forth. So in a very descriptive sense, uh, it's a, you know, um, kind of uh, multi-level governing mm? and the fact that uh, there is no just the uh, central state that can address uh, certain issues, but there are more and more actors that get involved uh, and uh, are engaged in, uh, in solving uh, different uh, specific issues. However, there are also more constraining understanding of multi-level governance, which is important to uh, consider. And we take a more um, specific perspective. And with this term, we, uh, in, we um, identify a specific mode of policy making or instance of policy making, which is based on three uh, conditions. So first of all, there have to be interactions on the vertical or intergovernmental uh, dimension. So more than uh, just one level of government has to be uh, involved in, in policy making processes. But it is not just a matter of intergovernmental relations. In multi-level governance, we have to find also um, multiple actors on the horizontal or state society dimension. So there are no, not only governmental authorities involved, but also uh, private actors, NGOs, civil society organizations more general. And another third criteria, which for us is important in order to uh, identify multi-level governance, 
is the fact that these um, different actors are trying to coordinate and collaborate with, with, with each other. So there should be some prevailing non-hierarchical and collaborative relations. Otherwise, we are in typical hierarchy or uh, conflict, conflict like modes of interaction. Here I show you how we uh, in this book uh, try to conceptualize multi-level governance. As you can see, it is um, a mode of policy making where collaboration is established both on the horizontal and on the vertical dimension. So at the same time, um, both um, governmental actors and uh, civil society is engaged. If there are just governmental actors um, working together at different levels, we have uh, an instance of intergovernmental relations. So we don't call this multi-level governance because in order to have multi-level governance, also the civil society, the horizontal dimension is, is there. So it is a specific way of um, addressing um, policy issues, uh, which try to bring together public and private and uh, non-public actors, but also among the public, public actors, uh, lo local authorities and uh, authorities at other level of uh, government. And then we have, you know, the traditional hierarchical uh, mode of policy making, where the collaboration might be there, but usually uh, it is uh, more a way of, um, of uh, directing top-down uh, and try to uh, establish top-down rules and uh, the other uh, levels of government or civil society uh, just uh, implementing or executing what is uh, a, a top-down policy. And then network governance is based on all sorts of collaboration on the uh, horizontal dimension, so between uh, local authorities and uh, civil society, but there is no uh, intergovernmental dimension. So this is taking place at just at an horizontal uh, level. Um, So um, the, the study uh, was carried out in the context, probably it was in the previous slide, uh, in the context of the so-called CISVAL projects uh, the, regarding the evaluation of the, um, of the uh, common, uh, common European um, asylum system. And in this project, we wanted to understand if there was any multi-level governance or these superior sections and which factors could uh, eventually uh, explain for the emergence, account for the emergence of multi-level governance. The first hypothesis we started with, we had in mind, was this classical institutional hypothesis about institution. So we started with the idea that uh, it might have been uh, more probable to find some multi-level governance in federalist or regionalist states where there is already some venue of coordination or collaboration among different levels of government. And this can provide an opportunity also for NGOs to get engaged. So this is a more, supposed to be a more flexible kind of structure or state structure than in unitary states where you know, the state is much more used to, uh, uh, to uh, enforce or uh, establish policies in a top-down manner. Here, there is already some in federalist system and regionalist system, we can think that there is already some way of balancing different interests and perspectives. And we should expect also a more open attitude towards enlarging the uh, uh, institutions or uh, actors engaged in policy making, also to civil society. So this was our first hypothesis. Um, but looking through the literature, you can find also a second hypothesis, which regards more generally uh, complexity as a trigger of multi-level governance. 
what does this mean? As I was saying before, um, the reception of asylum seekers brings in various actors, hmm? and at the local, at the national level, of course, but also at the local level, these uh, many NGOs already working in assisting poor people, or uh, we can imagine the local authorities providing all sorts of social assistance, or also schools that are engaged in providing education to, um, to uh, children uh, arriving with these inflows. So there is a complexity out there. And according, especially to uh, some um, American scholars working in a new public management tradition, all this complexity should drive actors together to uh, find a solution to um, take a problem solving perspective and try to uh, coordinate among each other because it is more rational. This is a functionalist perspective in the sense that. Uh, in, in, in this approach, uh, there is the assumption that at some point the actors have some interest in collaborating together in order to solve the problems at the grassroots level. And usually, in this perspective, multi level governance starts from uh, below. And so, our local authorities that try to push uh, national governments to get engaged and to have them to solve the issues. On, on, on the ground. Finally, the third hypothesis is similar to the second, but and so also takes um, a bottom up perspective and looks primarily at local governments and, and their agency. But still, uh, here in this hypothesis, the uh, assumption is not so much complexity as a driver, but rather. Local governments and local actors, different frames and understanding of the situation, and uh, especially uh, their interest in acting on the issue of asylum seekers' reception. So, in this perspective, it's not just local governments collaborating with different actors out of a necessity, because there is a problem out there that local governments want to solve. This is not necessarily the case. We expect in this hypothesis that some local governments will have an interest to intervene uh, because they think this is a right to do, this is the right thing to do. Others probably will not, or will even uh, not be uh, interested in collaborating on migration uh, altogether. In particular, in this third hypothesis, the political uh, orientation of the local authorities is very important in framing different ways of perceiving the challenges. So we, do that, we can expect that a progressive uh, local governments will be more, uh, more interested in intervening and uh, somehow getting engaged in this issue quite more conservative while should be once should be less uh, engaged. So very briefly, data methodology, I just said to you that um, I just mentioned this H 2020 project, uh, CISVAL, um, that uh, was um, carried out between uh, 2016 and 2019, and actually the data was collected <laughs> in, this, uh, in the context of this project. Um, and um, to, to evaluate, to assess the hypothesis uh, mentioned above, we analyzed uh, in the context of this project the multi level policy making processes and dynamics around asylum seekers after 2015. Considering different types of states hmm, that were actually engaged uh, in this project. So we had two unitary states, uh, Finland and Greece, two federal states like Germany and Spain, and then a, a regionalist one uh, like Italy. Hmm? And so different types of state structure. Uh, and in order uh, to see um, if the first hypothesis is, is 
uh, relevant, but also to uh, understand better the other hypothesis. From here, oh yeah. Uh, well, yeah, and, and then um, this is part of another project. Uh, I did also some analysis of policy making at the EU level with a specific focus on the partnership for the integration of migrants and refugees that was launched by the uh, Dutch presidency of uh, the European Council in 2016. And this was a partnership that engaged uh very much local authorities and also some ngos i will say more on the uh, national level though then if you want to know more about the partnership maybe we can also uh, go more into that on this so okay some key findings here um does the slides that yeah yeah okay yeah, just again on the data methods. Yeah, uh, but very briefly, um, the country case studies are based on qualitative, um, qualitative studies uh, that have analyzed both the national decision making process after 2015, so the national reforms of asylum seekers reception. But also, uh, we had some case studies of local implementation. And to this end, we um, uh, selected two cities uh, per country. So here you have an overview of the uh, cities that were analyzed. Whenever possible, we tried to combine you know, the saliency of the issue. So we chose uh, places, cities where there were, of course, uh, 2000 uh, migrants arriving uh, around 2015-2016, uh, but also on the other hand, we tried also to uh, combine uh, with uh, the political orientation of uh, of the local authorities. So, for instance, in the case of Italy, we have a city like Turin, which is traditionally left-wing leaning, and Treviso and Veneto area in general, which is traditionally more conservative. This was the case also with uh, Germany, uh, with the uh, Rhine-Westphalia uh, area, more uh, social democratic, and uh, Saxony, uh, more CDU, um, even though actually the city of Chemnitz at the time of our research was led by a social democratic um, administration, while the city of Aachen was uh, CDU administration. So we tried to, to balance a bit the uh, political uh, orientation of the cities. This was not possible in the case of Spain, because actually Barcelona and Madrid were the two main apps of the time uh, for the arrival of asylum seekers and refugees, but they were both more uh, quite progressive oriented. These were two. Uh, municipalities led by uh, platforms which were linked to Podemos. And also in the case of Athens and Thessaloniki, these two cities were uh, quite uh, progressive at the time. In Finland, we were able to uh, keep this uh, progressive in the case of Pargas and uh, conservative in the case of uh, Lentula uh, um, selection. But this was not always easy because we needed also to see places where you know things were happening in 2005. The places where there were uh, no uh, reception taking place. So basically, yeah, here we come to some key findings. So first of all, regarding decision making, we can see from this table that is based on the results of the study that MLG was. Uh, very uh, scarce in some respects. We find some experience in Italy between 2014 and 2016, but from 2017 onwards, uh, actually, uh, the, these MLG experiences were uh, abandoned and the new reforms actually were uh, decided very much top down by the, the national government. 
Germany was very much a case of intergovernmental relations with a lot of participation from the land levels or uh, and also local authorities in some respects, but not that much uh, at the level at least of national decision making. There was not so much collaboration of NGOs, while in Italy, main NGOs like Caritas or other big associations uh, engaged in asylum seekers receptions were also participating in some uh, national coordination uh, roundtables. And then we see more prevail as a prevailing part, uh, pattern the hierarchical mode of decision making, which is easy to expect in the case of Greece and Finland, Finland that are unitary states, maybe less in that of Spain. Hmm? We will go uh, back to this. Uh, let's see now the implementation. In the implementation, uh, what is interesting to, to see is that actually we don't find any multi-level governance. Uh, all what is going on, it's quite the opposite of what we are seeing in the uh, national uh, decision making. So here we find a lot of horizontal networks taking place between local administrations and NGOs. It doesn't matter so much, uh, you know, the uh, type of overall system. Most of the, um, uh, the actors that were engaged in implementation in, um, in all the cases we have been analyzing uh, was uh, engaging a lot of NGOs and local authorities. In the case of Italy and Greece, it is interesting to note that there was, at least for some time, some engagement of the national level in, in Italy. In the case of Greece, we have quite a remarkable engagement of uh, international organizations, also at the local level. So especially in the case of Athens and Saloniki, uh, there was a direct in, in engagement of the EU, uh, HNCR, and so um, this is uh, closer to multi-level governance, even though the national level was actually absent in, in that case. In the case of Italy, while there was more national level and, uh, and some NGOs uh, also in the implementation. So moving to the conclusions, what we can say. Well, multi-level governance. At the end of the day, we found very few instances of that, as we said. Uh, hierarchy has been prevailing in national decision making, um, especially uh, in also uh, during the crisis. It seems that all the reforms that were approved after 2015 were riding, rather reinforcing the role of the central government to oversee the system rather than trying to coordinate with other actors. So these reforms was, were very much taken and uh, approved in a top-down manner by the national government. Also in, in Italy, where before there were some attempts to engage uh, other um, civil society and local actors in uh, decision making. While in the case of implementation, we find much more network governance and horizontal networks. The refugee crisis actually was much more an opportunity to strengthen uh, the national governments rather than to collaborate with <laughs> other actors in the field. And the national governments actually took this opportunity to pursue their own different goals. Uh, we see uh, in, for instance, in, in the case of Germany, the, the goal was that of reducing the costs of reception, also in the case of Finland, uh, also speeding up the asylum procedures in the case of Spain was very important, or in the case of Italy, the, the goal was rather that of reducing the influence of local authorities that were before engaged in, somehow in the system, and this was, you know, uh, leading to um, all sorts of conflicts. Also in the case of Spain, we find a lot of conflicts and so the attempts to reduce the voice of, of local authorities. 
So why so little multilevel governance? We had a hypothesis to explain multilevel governance, but at the end of the day, we didn't find much. So we tried to explain why we uh, don't see so much uh, multilevel governance. Certainly, um, the federalism and the functional, functionalist perspective don't seem to be so relevant. Hmm? Uh, because uh, at the end of the day, we don't see much uh, multilevel governance as we would have expected. Um, the local government agency seems more um, to have a greater uh, explanatory leverage. Certainly, there was a lot of activism uh, on the sides of progressive local governments that tried also to mobilize on the vertical dimension to push uh, the national governments and also the EU uh, to be more engaged in, uh, in, in coordinating uh, the uh, reception of asylum seekers. However, these networks that were taking place at the local level were not really uh, scaled up to a national level strategy and the broader uh, attempt to deal with this issue of asylum seekers reception. Uh, national governments seem to have been able to, um, to keep a strong gatekeeping role uh, and so, uh, you know, somehow constraining uh, the scope of energy policy making, trying to limit the role of local governments. So, National governments at the end of the day emerge as very important in uh, rather uh, constraining MLG or enabling in some in some context if we think at, of Italy before uh, 2016. So in other terms, if the national government allows some multilevel governance, then you know progressive uh, progressive uh, authorities, local level authorities, have the opportunity to scale up their uh, experiences and, you know, in the case of Italy, the round table, the coordination uh, round table um, at the national level was an experience that uh, enabled um, NGOs like Caritas, but also some big uh, progressive cities in Italy to um, to uh, set parts of the national agendas. But when the national government decided that this was not uh, feasible anymore, so this opportunity uh, suddenly was abandoned, abandoned. And so it is not sufficient that you have local level mobilization. You need also to have some you know, opening or uh, an interest at the level of the national government for multilevel governance to take place. So at the end of the day, you still need some uh, top-down uh, strategy. So to conclude and you know to also think at possible uh, uh, new uh, uh, new crises that uh, might be uh, can, coming. You, we are uh, going through another one now with the uh, war in, in, in Ukraine, uh, but. We know there might be more. So, uh, asylum from our study seems to be one of those least likely cases for multi developers. I mean, there's a lot of politicization uh, and crises like uh, the uh, 2015 refugee crisis seem to have triggered more politicization rather than coordination. So uh, on, on the case we have uh, seen in the case of Italy, there was some coordination, but that suddenly collapsed in 2016 because of the mounting and increasing politicization of, of the issue also at the EU level. Uh, it is important to remind that in the summer of 2015, the agenda for uh, migration was approved by the European Commission, um, and this uh, established the so-called hotspot approach. So migrants who were arriving in Italy had to be uh, immediately, uh, immediately identified and registered. 
before Italian authorities were somehow a bit toler tolerating the fact that this didn't uh, take place all the time. So, but by enforcing the hotspot approach and enforcing identification, of course, uh, Italy had to uh, to deal with uh, a huger uh, number of people seeking accommodation and uh, reception services. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, this uh, politicization that was instrumentally uh, exploited by right-wing parties like uh, the uh, Lega um, of uh, Salvini um, led also left-wing governments because in 2017 uh, there was actually a left-wing majority. Uh, 16, 17, uh, there was the Gentiloni government to take uh, very top-down and uh, kind of uh, restrictive policies. And so there was, as I was saying before, um, um, kind of redefinition of the system with uh, local authorities being marginalized in the, uh, in the uh, implementation of exception policies. So this politicization does doesn't seem to be um, kind of good opportunity for a, a multi-level governance to emerge. The more the issues politicized, the more we expect to have um, more hierarchical, traditional top-down uh, decisions to be enforced at the local level. During the pandemic, actually, this situation was quite clear and there were a lot of uh, in, in, in all European countries uh, a lot of uh, anti-immigrant sentiments even though there was some discourse on the uh, so-called key workers or uh, essential workers but still the pandemic uh, was um, characterized by a tightening of national borders and this uh, did not help of course the uh, coordination with uh, different levels of governance and also with NGOs. Ukrainian crisis might be different, we don't know yet, of course. Um, the level of politicization is different to understand uh, currently. We are still in a situation that is uh, ongoing. What we see, though, from I think from the countries that are uh, on the front line and Poland, but also Italy and Spain in many respects, is that in this new crisis there is a greater role of grassroots networks of previous Ukrainian migrants that are very much engaged in somehow uh, assisting uh, people that is arriving, but also in the future we might think or, uh, you know, uh, also in, in the near future in uh, supporting some advocacy, some uh, political advocacy for Ukrainian migrants. And we see that, for instance, uh, in Italy there are already some organizations that are emerging and uh, try to act as spokespersons of Ukrainian migrants. Uh, well, this was not the case with the previous uh, with the previous groups that probably since there weren't already uh, or not so many migrants from these countries, um, these networks um, have not been uh, present and uh, integration was much more reliant on public intervention, on uh, public policies. In the case of Ukrainians, probably we'll see much more engagement uh, at the community level. And then also another point I want to to uh, underline is, you know, of course, the limitations of the studies and future research um, possible path. There is certainly a need to take into account a multiplicity of local partners. As I told before in the slides, this study was quite limited in the selection of local cases. And so we had to take into account situations where there were some exceptions going on, but this meant that we could not really uh, select on the 
political variable hmm? and so to uh, consider um you know both uh, progressive and conservative uh, municipalities in many cases we we had an over representation of progressive municipalities i was saying in the case of spain actually barcelona and madrid were both accommodating migrants during the uh, post 2014 crisis so um currently with another uh, h 2020 project which is called polcom we are trying to consider small communities, so small and medium-sized cities that were not so much uh, in the uh, frame of the uh, CISVAL project, rural areas, and also to try to strike a balance between progressive um, municipalities and not progressive conservative. Also trying to uh, analyze some extreme case of uh, lack of, an, of accommodation. Mm -hmm and which you can imagine is not easy because usually these uh, local authorities in these municipalities don't want to be bothered in these issues but still i think it's important from um for example from a scientific point of view to balance the uh, the, uh, uh, the sample otherwise uh, the, the risk is that of having just uh, part of the story. Um, to really conclude, yeah, I think I can thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>